Uh, in the next subsection, we'll look at Cartesian trees as a alternative look at the range minimum query problem that will ultimately help us uh, to find a, a better solution than the n log n entries uh, of a sparse table. Um, but let me first uh, just, just show what it is before we uh, motivate it much from an algorithmic point of view. Um, now, let me, let me point out here to make the picture or make the, the picture analogy, the metaphor work well, here RMQ is the range maximum. You could have done it with minimum and then uh, draw the picture the other way around. Um, but we're computer scientists, our trees have a single root and it's at the top. Let's stick with that very sens sens uh, sensical notion. So um, imagine you have an array of numbers and you want to solve the range maximum query problem. So for every range you want to know what the maximum in that range is. And uh, to visualize it, let me draw uh, a bar or pole uh, instead of the numbers that has as height than the value of that number. The overall maximum is then obvious from just visual inspection. It's, it's this one, right? But if you want uh, a range max, you can do the same. You, you constrain the array or the picture to a certain, certain vertical slab. And then within that, it's the, the pole that sticks up the most. So as a human, it's obvious in the small example what the maximum would be and where it is. OK, so as before, that's just the definition. And I'll point out again, for, for this picture, I'll flip the notion of min and max just to make it nicer to draw. OK, here it is. For uh, the overall task, we'll pre-process the, the answer to um, the, the array to get a faster answer. Now the Cartesian tree um, results as follows. You uh, have a root node at the overall maximum. That's this position in, in, in our example. And then that basically splits the problem into two halves, maybe everything to the left and everything to the right. In this case, the to the right part is tiny, but uh, in general, it's, it's two parts. And then you compute recursively the same Cartesian tree on these two subproblems and make them, so there's some subproblem tree coming here. And, okay, let's make this a bit nicer. Uh, there's some subproblem subtree coming from this, coming from this. And you append those as the left and right child of this root node. Okay, again in nice. If I take everything to the left of that node, the next largest is this element. So that becomes the root of another Cartesian tree, a subtree, and it, it becomes the left child of the overall maximum. And similar on the right, well, there's just a single element, so it's uh, just a single node, but it becomes the right child of the root. Now we further split up things. So there's the range between those two, and there's the range left of this guy. So in general, we will always have ranges that are from some uh, previous node to some other, so between two poles. And on those, we recurse. So here again, if I let this largest element between those two is this, so that becomes the next node. Largest element in this range is that one, so that becomes the next node. One more time. Largest element to the left of that node is that. Largest element between those two is this one. Between those two is this one. I guess you, you get the picture now. So you recursively refine the range, and always the maximum becomes the next node that you connect to what you've already constructed. OK, awkward definition. Why do we do this? OK, uh, that's just taken an array of numbers and define a binary tree somehow. But what's, why is that any good? 
The reason is that there's a connection between this and finding the range maximum. And so that connection is, if I have a range, I can find the nodes in the tree that correspond to the leftmost and rightmost entry in that range. Um, I didn't comment on this earlier. In this, in this tree, I've, note, I've labeled every node with its in-order rank or with its, its position from left to right. I have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So I'm just sliding a line left to right over this, over this picture and assigning consecutive numbers. This happens to be the same as the index of the array element that the pole represents. So if I want the range from 6 to 14, I just find the nodes labeled 6 and 14 in my picture. Now the range maximum always is the lowest common ancestor of those two nodes in the tree. And why is that? Well, uh, from each of these nodes, we have to have a path to the overall maximum. If the overall maximum is within that range, then it surely is the maximum in the range. The other option is it's outside of the range. But then, because this is a binary tree, there must be some node where we split the path, where one part of the path continues to go to 6 and the other continues to go to 14. So there must be some node in the range between those two where the path split. And that node, when that was generated, it was to the left or to the right of the overall route, or recursively, it was between two large things that are outside of the range. Uh, and then this was the first element in the range that was uh, assigned, assigned a node. Well, the other, the other way to say it, uh, the paths of these two nodes, they split at the earliest thing that is, well, <laughs> they split at the, the highest pole that's between those two, because afterwards, they will never be in the same subproblem. So if you have, if you have this range uh, at any point in time contained in a larger range, for example, this one, then either the 6 and 14 stay on the same side of the large pole or they're separated now and for good. So that connection uh, is, acute, is a acute observation. Um, and it goes a little further, so uh, you don't actually need the poles anymore. All you need is the mapping from the array indices to these, to these nodes. So you can find what are the nodes that correspond to the leftmost, rightmost position. And then you can find the lowest common ancestor from those. And that even works if you rearrange how, well, the y-coordinate of the nodes. In this case, it, it was still reflecting the values in the array. But it, all we're doing is looking at the in-order index of a node and finding lowest common ancestors. None of that uses the y-coordinate. So it also works if you just draw the tree in a, in a standard way here, like a, the y-coordinate is just the depth in the tree. So all that's, all that's needed to answer range minimum queries is this binary tree. We don't need any values in the array. Uh, let's see if that, if that is clear enough. Uh, so here's a little um, Cartesian tree, and I haven't shown you the array that, goes, that could go along with it. And are we one based or zero based? It's always zero based, right?
So there's several steps now. Um, maybe one good in-between thing would be, how do I get these numbers? Uh, here I still have them. How do I get, if I just have the tree as the usual pointer structure and so on, how do I get these numbers inside the nodes? I can do that with an in-order traversal, which looks as follows. I start at the root, and then um, at each node, I first process the left subtree, then I assign the value of the root of the current node, and then I process, uh, the other way around, process the right subtree. First left, then myself, then right. That's in-order traversal. So, well, say left, self, right. And what does self mean? Self means I'm assigning myself the next free number. Let's do this um, on here. So I walk from the root. I first go left. Okay. I arrive at a new node. I first go left. Okay. First go left. First go left. I always walk down left doing nothing. Now, at this point, there's no left, so I come back from the empty left, and now I assign the first number to this node, okay? So this gets the zero, because I'm in the self part of treating this node. Then I go to the right subtree, that's empty too, so nothing happens, and then I return, and now I walk back up. Now I've done, for that node, I've done the entire left subtree. So now is this guy's turn, and he gets the number one. I'm done with the self part of that node, so I go down to the right subtree. That again, I go to the left, empty, come back. Now I assign the next free number, which is two. And so on and so forth. So here, right is again empty, so I come back. Right is done, so I'm finished here. Now I come back for this node, all the left subtree has been dealt with. So now it's the self part, so I'm assigning this node the next free number. Three. Now I go to the right subtree, but that's empty, so I come back immediately, go back up. I've done with the whole left subtree of that node, so guess what's coming next? It gets its number, which is four. Now I'm going to the right subtree. Okay, I arrive at a new node again. First thing we do is go left, so we go left. There's no left here, so that one is treated next. It gets the next free number, number five. Okay, so you keep, keep going like this. If we do the same in this picture, walk down, walk down, dashed line. Walk down, walk down, walk down, until you can no longer. Then you return from the left. So this guy gets the first index, one, a zero. Nothing in the right, so we come, come back up to this. Uh, let me finish drawing this path around the tree, and then we'll just follow it. So we're, we're at this point. We're dealt with the done with the left subtree, so this gets assigned a number. We go to the right subtree. There's nothing on the left. Now it's the self part, two. Nothing on the right, so we come back up. This has all the left dealt with, so the next is assigned a three. Then we go to the right. And if you keep assigning the indices with this, you get these labels for the nodes. So that also means you can project this down to the array entries. So there's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay. What do we get for RMQ15 in this case? Um, that's maybe the point where we can show the answers. There's various votes for various numbers. <laughs> Uh, 
And first step we have to do is we find 1 and 5 in the array. That's the range that we're looking at. The trouble is we don't have the numbers in the array, so we cannot just use that information. Instead, we have to use the tree. So we go to the nodes that have 1 and 5. And we find the lowest common ancestor, which is 3. That's where they split. And so 3 is the answer, because at position 3, there must have been the maximum here. OK? So this is the maximum if that's the Cartesian tree, even without knowing what the real numbers are. And here's one concrete, I mean, I generated ex the example using, using these numbers. Uh, there's others that would have given the same tree. If you look at the, the range 1, 5, then 7 is the largest here. And you can double check that you get the tree if you apply the construction from before with the poles and letting lines sink down. So there's that in nice again. OK, that was step one. That's the Cartesian tree. Uh, all this means so far is if I have the tree, I know for all the RMQ queries, I know what the answer is. It's not necessarily fast to find it, because I would still need to find lowest common ancestors. And now we're running a little bit in circles. In unit 8, I told you, ah, you can, you can do uh, longest common extensions by doing lowest common ancestors in the suffix tree. But now you see you need lowest common ancestors to do RMQ. So it, it doesn't seem to go anywhere. Uh, but uh, bear with me for a bit. I use a larger example if you just uh, generate some random numbers. Uh, but it's just a binary tree, really. The second important ingredient is the following. We can count how many different binary trees there are, and we'll find that, indeed, many different arrays will lead to the same Cartesian tree. So if you just have your RMQ, gla RMQ gla glasses on, all from an array that everything you see from an array are the answers it gives to RMQ queries, then many arrays are equivalent. They give the same answers to all RMQ queries. Um, because there's not enough Cartesian trees to give different answers, and uh, given the Cartesian tree, all RMQ answers are predetermined, because all that you ever do is find lowest common ancestors. OK. Um, So let's first count the number of binary trees. If I have uh, an, an array of length n, I'll have n nodes in this tree. How many different binary tree shapes are there? Well, you can, uh, you can look at small numbers. For example, for two nodes, a binary tree can look like this, or it can look like this. That's the only two options. How many do we have with, uh, with three nodes? Well, there's the balanced one. We have this, this cherry shape. Uh, and then there's various ways of unbalanced trees, where it's essentially a straight line. But it can be straight in different directions. And so it's overall five different options. These are, these are all possible options. There's no other options. So people have, have studied this, and it turns out you can precisely calculate how many trees you can get with n numbers. That's the Catalan numbers. But this is not a combinatorics class, so uh, uh, I won't go into this at all. What's easy to see is an upper bound. And that comes back to the compression unit. What we can do is we can encode every binary tree with uh, a certain number of bits, and because there's only so and so many bit strings with a certain number of bits, we get an upper bound for the number of different trees that there can be. Because the encoding will be such that I can reconstruct the tree from it. So more precisely, um,
we can encode a tree with two n bits. And then 2 to the 2n is the number of different bit strings of length 2n. And uh, each of those gives at most one tree. So there's um, at most so many different binary trees. And what does the encoding look like? It's actually very simple. Uh, you do a traversal of your tree, similar as before. So we do this kind of walk around the tree. And uh, whenever I visit a node first, I store whether it has a left and whether it has a right child with two bits. Right, so I'm, I'm using two bits per node. So for each node, I store whether it has um, a left and a right child, but just using one bit each. So this node would be, uh, and I'm following this, so this one node would be 1-1 one, one because it has both a left and a right child. This next node would be another 1-1 one, one because it has both children, and this one too. But this one would be a 0-0 zero, zero because it's a leaf. And this one's also a 0-0. Zero, zero. And then this one is more interesting. It has no left child, so 0, but a right child, 0-1. Zero, That's a 0-0 zero, zero again, and a 0-0. Zero, zero. And I would encode these in the order I find them following the orange line. So it would be 1-1, 1-1, 1-1, 0-0. 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. The question now becomes, how can I decode the tree again? That sounds, sounds tricky, but it's, it's always possible. And uh, uh, stay where you are. To, uh, to convince you, let me go to a new page and you can rely on my poor memory that I can't memorize what the tree looks like and I won't cheat. <laughs> so you start at the beginning, you have two bits and they say there's a root and it has both children because it's one one. And that means the orange line continues to the left and there's another node, okay, also has both children. So the orange line continues further here. Again we have one one so I'm, I'm here now. Now I'm seeing two zeros, so the next thing I'm doing has no, no children, it's a leaf. But then the orange line knows this is the next one we decode. That's another zero, zero, so there's no, no children. Then the orange line continues back up here to the next dangling edge. And that's a zero, one, so it's a node with no edge here but an edge here. That means orange line continues down here. And the left two last two things is, again, append two more leaves, OK? And so if you check, that's, that's essentially the same tree. It's just drawn slightly, uh, slightly deformed, but the same parent-child relations. So we can encode a binary tree with two n bits. Amazing. But how does that help us? 